Right, Mike. Uh, let's continue talking about uh, how did we get our New Testament, uh, both the specific books and also how do we know that the manuscripts have been faithfully copied and reliably preserved, uh, starting with the canon. Uh, how did we get the canon and especially what's the relationship between canon and covenant? Yeah, it's a, it's a great place to start. I mean, one of the things that Bauer always claims, as you know, is that, that when it came to which books Christians read, it was all over the map. You know, Bauer gave the impression it was sort of this literary free-for-all. And so our section in this book on canon, I think, was designed to push against that, to say, well, hold on a second. Canon is not sort of this wide-open affair that's late and formulated by Constantine, but it seems to sort of be innate to early Christianity and kind of grow up within it. And one of the ways I show that is by the link between canon and covenant. People think that early Christians were only interested in oral tradition. They weren't interested in having books anyway, and it was only later that got kind of pushed on them. But when you realize that, that, that the, the early canon was seen as covenant documents, that it was seen as God's deposit of a new covenant arrangement, you realize, well, hold on a second. Christians thought of what they were in as the new covenant from the start. And mm -hmm. Jesus at the Last Supper declared that, that this is an inauguration of the new covenant in my blood. And so if, if old if Old Covenant uh, arrangements had a written deposit of text, uh, we just simply make the argument that a New Covenant arrangement would likely also have a written deposit of, of text. And if so, then that just shows you that this idea of a, of a sacred collection of writings is not a late idea. It's just sort of born up within the Christian movement. It grows naturally, innately from within. Uh, so we could even argue in some sense the seed of the covenant idea was already in the soil, even if you couldn't see the plant yet. I think that's a brilliant argument, yeah. and I think maybe just uh, some people watching this may be interested in, in maybe let's look at the Gospels, for example. Yeah. Is it really true that it was only in the fourth century that the church decided we're going to pick those four Gospels and not you know, some of the Gnostic Gospels like Thomas or Philip or some of the others? How would we respond to yeah, that? Yeah, this is a, a common narrative for those who follow the Bauer thesis. It's this idea that, well, some people read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but then the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Mary were equally popular and uh, just as valid. And like you said, not until much later were the, were, the, were the decisions made. But when we look at the historical evidence, that's just not the case at all, as you well know. First of all, as far back as we can see, when we look at citations from Gospels, the citations from the canonical Gospels are just so much more frequent so much more common and outweigh in dramatic fashion citations from so any other gospels. go to the gospels. church fathers yes. as an important body. So the church fathers make it very clear that we're using these four and, and, and not others. And on top of that, you could ask the question, which books or which gospels did the church fathers cite as scripture? And once again, it seems to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I also talk about the manuscripts left behind. When we, when we want to know which books Christians were reading, we can determine that by the amount of copies we, we find. And again, the canonical Gospels outmatch the, the apocryphal ones in, in great numbers. And so all that tells us that when you ask the question of what Gospels early Christians were reading, it's not as if it were up in the air. It seems to be that there was a core collection of Gospels from, from a very early time in a way that doesn't seem like it was really ever that much in doubt. Mm -hmm. Even Bart Ehrman spoke the lost scriptures. Mm -hmm. I, if memory serves, he, of course, left no stone unturned mm -hmm. to, to find those uh, alternative gospels. But I think there's only about 17 gospels total listed, including the secret gospel of Mark, which has been, uh, I think, unmasked as a hoax, and, <laughs> and, and, and others that are infancy gospels, not yes. even covering, you know, Jesus' entire uh, earthly ministry and, and, yeah. and, and, and uh, sayings collections, which probably calling them gospels is a misnomer in any case. That's right. So that once you really whittle down supposed rival gospels, uh, it doesn't take long before the four gospels are the only four that are left standing. That's right. And you could ask the question a different way. You could, you could ask the question this way, which gospels in early Christianity look like they're finishing the Old Testament story? You know, if you ask it like that, then there's only four, really. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because you read a gospel like the Gospel of Thomas, it's not at all interested in the Old Testament. It's not finishing the Old Testament story. It doesn't place Jesus in the context of Israel or anything like that. And as you mentioned, these saints' gospels, these infancy gospels, they're clearly late, legendary, embellished, without an Old Testament framework around it. Mm -hmm. if, if early Christians were committed to the Old Testament, and they were, we would have expected them to pick gospels and read Gospels that, that were viewed as finishing the Old Testament narrative. And when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can see that that's what they're doing. They are presenting themselves as the, as the end of an older story. 
So it's not so much that the story of Jesus in the Gospels is a new story. It's more like the completion of an old story. Yes. And when you realize that, you realize, oh, wait a second. Uh, Christians wouldn't have had to look very far to find out which mm -hmm. Gospels would have done That's that. Right. Now, playing devil's advocate just mm -hmm. for another minute here, what yeah. about the Gospel of Thomas? You know mm -hmm. that the Jesus Seminar uh, published a book, The Five Gospels, right. and supposedly, uh, listening to many of them, the fellows of the Jesus Seminar, yeah. the, the, the Gospel of Thomas is the, the most primitive, uh, the earliest of, of, of all of them. Uh, on what grounds are we rejecting uh, the Gospel yeah. of Thomas? No, the, the Gospel of Thomas, as you indicated, is the, is the darling of, of many in the and the Jesus Seminar in, in higher critical scholarship, and that's probably the only gospel that has, has ever been seriously attempted to be put in the first century along with the canonical four. What's curious to note, though, is that modern scholars as a whole have not received that. Um, there's always some pockets of scholars that have tried to put Thomas in the first century, but collectively, modern scholars have not been persuaded by that. Even Bart Ehrman, whose name we keep mentioning here, is, is he doesn't think Thomas is a first century gospel at all. I think. Thomas is a second century gospel and recognizes that there's very good reasons to think that. I, I think also of some recent books that have just come out, mm -hmm. one by, by, by Simon Gathercole and one by Mark Goodacre that have both mm -hmm. argued for Thomas as mm -hmm. a second century Absolutely. gospel. And so the evidence is, I think, pretty persuasive that if you want to get back to the first century, there's only four gospels that get you there, mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, mm -hmm. Luke, and John. That's right. That's right. One more uh, issue that occasionally comes up, which is that of early canonical lists, such as yeah. the so-called Moratorian Canon. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, some controversy has swirled around the traditional date for that list, which is around 180 mm -hmm. AD, which would be very early. Uh, and of course, that uh, canonical list also lists Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and only those four That's Gospels. Right. Uh, uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, that controversy and how liberal scholars have, 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 have tried to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, marginalize that, uh, that important piece of historical evidence. Yeah, uh, you know, for, for critical scholars that want to have the idea that, that there was no set gospels in early Christianity, that the moratorium fragment gets in the way. Because that early list, as you indicated, traditionally dated to the second century, seems to indicate that everyone was fairly unified around at least the four gospels. And so... Some scholars, really led by Albert Sundberg in his initial work and then mm -hmm. followed by, by Jeffrey Hanneman and others, have tried to push the Moratorian list into the fourth century. But what, once again, what's interesting is that modern scholars haven't followed suit as a whole. Certainly there have been people who've, who've uh, followed Sundberg. But as a whole, scholars across the board have regularly realized the evidence just doesn't put it there. Time and time again, scholars have recognized that the, the Moratorian fragment is really a second century text. Um, and what's interesting about it is it's really confirmed by other second century evidence because it's not alone in the second century as something that advocates four gospels. Mm -hmm. So you could say, well, look, it's not just the Moratorian Canon, it's Irenaeus, four yeah. gospels, mm -hmm. Clement of Alexandria, four gospels, Tertullian soon thereafter, mm -hmm. four gospels. Uh, you know, this time period, the, the, the list of, of the Moratorian fragment is not an anomaly. Mm -hmm. It's just doing what it seems like everybody else has been doing. And so, intriguingly, it turns out that conservatives who are sometimes, uh, you know, accused of, 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 of maybe tweaking the evidence yeah. to make it fit their preconceived uh, notions of, of, of doctrine uh, turn out to actually have the evidence, historical evidence, yes. uh, compellingly on their side. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, when, when you do, st this is why I think the study of the canon is such a, fruitful enterprise for, for uh, evangelicals because, you know, time and time again, it seems like there's a great deal of unity around these books. And, and there can be an attempt to try to say there's more diversity than there was. And we're not denying that there was some diversity and that there were disagreements here and there or that people did read other books. Of course that happened. But collectively as a whole, there was a core New Testament um, from a very early time. And that, that swims right in the face of Bauer's thesis.